Welcome everybody to today's Bible study on the One Accord server. We're here at the Sanctuary and we're going to do a deep dive on maybe a most important element of the Sanctuary, which is the Altar of Burnt Sacrifice. And we're going to go a deep dive onto it. I'm actually surprised how many people have no idea what the altar symbolizes. Sheep and other animals are being killed, slaughtered, and burned on this altar. And yet, if we don't understand the significance of it, we're missing out on something really, really big and important that the Bible really wants us to know. So we're going to dive into what does that altar represent. You might realize there's layers to it you never thought about. This will be something new for everybody let's look at the altar in the context of the overall sanctuary the whole sanctuary is all symbolic of different things we have the outer courtyard with the wall around it we have the gate that you enter into and the first thing the main thing you'll see is the altar of burnt sacrifice so it's the first thing and this is why we'll talk about it first then we have the bronze laver which is a place for washing. And then we have the tent of meeting and we come inside. Everything now has gone from bronze to what? The table with the showbread is overlaid with gold. The, the torch is overlaid with gold. The altar of incense is gold. And if we go inside the most holy place, again, lots of gold, even the Ark of the Covenant with the gold cherubim on it. So gold, 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 gold. And what happens when we step back outside the tabernacle? What metals do we see? Like a bronze? Yeah, bronze. Those of you who are new to us, this is a downloadable world. And you could also join us on Discord and get a tour for yourself. So you could go through, read it on your own. Exodus 41, God's telling them what to do. And you could see that God wants the altar and then the laver all these different things you could come in read it as you see the altar of gold incense so gold there if we come over here we get a bit more of the metals exodus 39 verse 32 again god's going through make this and make that and talking about the gold altar you always see gold altar every time it's gold altar it's talking about the altar of incense inside the holy place but we are today setting the bronze altar the altar a burnt sacrifice and so it's bronze it's great as bronze the utensils around it are bronze and it's a little hard to figure out but i believe the bible also says all these little posts around this courtyard are going to be bronze even though there's some silver fittings on it i want you guys to put your thinking caps on so exodus 27 if we go there it says make an altar of acacia wood five cubits long five cubits wide the altar shall be square, and the height of it must be three cubits, and make the horns of four corners of it, and overlay it with brass, and make a mesh with brass, and make four brass rings on it. And so we keep coming back to brass, 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 overlay with brass. Hmm. Question number four, what do you think might be the significance of the difference in the metals? Like how you have gold in the most holy place, in holy place, but bronze is here in the courtyard. That's Why do question. we have bronze? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, there is like a, isn't there, there's something to do with like the type of metal, how it purifies things and that kind of stuff. Like it can hold water, mm -hmm. you know, last against heat, that kind of stuff. But there's probably a deeper meaning. Yeah, there is a deeper meaning. And that is what we're going to just start exploring. Oh, excellent. All right, everybody out. And this begins our journey deeper into the sanctuary. Now we're getting into the really interesting stuff. Can I get one of you to volunteer to read this? Behold, these are the ungodly prosper in the world, increasing in riches, truly in vain. I have cleansed my heart and washed my hand, hands in innocency. For I have been plagued all today long and ch ch chased them every morning oh when i thought to know this it was too painful for me until i entered the sanctuary of god then i understood the event we're, we're reading from the psalms and it's and the question is what was this psalmist frustrated about the ungodly people seem to be doing great they seem to be getting richer and yet here he is a man of god maybe he's suffering and we often talk about this, right? Why, why do we have suffering in the world? And why do, do bad people seem to be doing great? 
and the good people suffering. What made the psalmist feel better? Well, it seems like the sanctuary made him feel better. Then he understood why um, he felt the way he felt and also how God feels to those that are doing well, you know, um, sort of well also forgetting him, you know, that kind of thing. So this whole context here is about the ungodly mm -hmm. and how they seem to have it great. And then he says, all this was too painful to me until I entered the sanctuary of God and I understood their end. Mm. Whose end? The ungodly. Yeah. I see. So some, something about this sanctuary is telling the psalmist about the end of the wicked. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought that there might be something in the sanctuary teaching about that? Yeah, I guess I have thought about it, but maybe not in a great detail. So today would be the day. Korah's Rebellion, Numbers 16. Now Korah, the son of Ezra, uh, the son of Korath, the son of Levi, and of Dathan and Abram, the sons of Elabab and On, and the sons of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men uh, too, and they rose up against Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Verse 16 says, And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your followers are to appear before the Lord. You they and Aaron and each man is to take his censure and put incense in it and each bring his censer before the Lord 250 censers you also and Aaron each of you shall bring his censure I think verse 18 and each man took his censure and put fire into it and laid the incense on it and um, stood in the door of the tents of the meeting with Moses and Aaron and Korah gathered all of his followers, opposing them before the door of the tent meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to remove the censures from the scorched remains and scatter the coals some distance away, for they are holy." The censors of these men, who had sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into broad plates or a covering of the altar. Because they offered them before the Lord, they are holy, and they shall be a sign to the children of Israel. And Eleazar and the priests took the bronze censers, which, which those who are burned had offered, and were hammered into broad plates to cover the altar to be reminded to the children of Israel that no stranger who is not of the seed of Aaron come near to the offer instance before the Lord, or he would become like Korah and his followers, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. Very good. Now the discussion question. So what did Korah and his followers do? What did Korah and his followers do? Well, they rose up against Moses, all right? So they had their own plans and all that kind of stuff. Right. And then they sort of were kind of sick of him being the one in charge. More or less, that's what it kind of came down to. And they thought they had a better way. So basically, were they good guys or very bad guys? They were bad guys, for sure. Yeah. All right, next question. What was the fate of Korah and his followers? Well, you know, death by fire, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What did God instruct be done to remind others not to do the same as Korah and his followers? What did it just say? It said that they took the remains of what they had and they made brass plates out of it. Is that what I read? I think that's pretty sure that's what I read. Yeah, so Korah and his followers, they were all standing around with bronze censers. Mm -hmm. Offering like they were the priests. And of course, God sent fireballs, <laughs> consumed them all, and... Uh, and then what would be left would be metal. And God said, yeah, take that metal and hammer it into the altar. Mm. There's actually a lot of Psalms written by the sons of Korah. So really? not all the descendants of Korah were wiped out. Certain um, Psalms will say a Psalm of the sons of Korah. And they were the singers of the, of the uh, congregation, like during the time of David. Right. And, and they, again, contribute to the psalm. So it's very likely this psalmist of this earlier psalm we looked at, Psalm 73, maybe had a little bit of Korah on the mind 
when he's looking at the altar and thinking, hmm, somehow this is telling me about the fate of the wicked. Let's see. What material were the 250 sensors made of? The bronze, no? Yep, bronze. And then what is the material the altar of burnt sacrifice is made of? Uh, bronze, right? Yeah. Minecraft, this is copper, but it's close enough. Yeah, it's yeah. it's all the same. So what did God want the Israelites to see when they looked at the altar of burnt sacrifice? Well, they wanted to see their... They wanted the... I'm sure he wanted them to see that for remission of their sins or wrongdoings, something else had to go through suffering, right? There was a penalty to it. I like what you said about penalty. I think you're onto something there. Hmm. So I'll put this back to page one for the instructions. All right. Did you guys hear something open up? Yes. There's a light over here. Sweet. Day of sacrifice. Read the next two verses. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling uh, aroma. Ephesians 5, 2. So what would happen if Christ wasn't our sacrifice? That's a big question there. <laughs> Zephaniah 1, 7 through 8 says, Hold your peace at your presence of the Lord God, because the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has bid his guest. Number verse 8 says, And it will come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all who are clothed with strange apparel. Jeremiah 46, 10. For this is a day the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself of his enemies, and the sword will devour, and may be satisfied, and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country. And then Isaiah 34, 6 to 10. I think th there's an interesting theme here where God keeps having a sacrifice and a slaughter, but are these of animals or God or sacrifice to something else? Right. And then we look here again, it's, it's not just God talking about animals, it's like the whole earth is going to be burned up. Mm -hmm. Who or what is the sacrifice in these verses? It's hmm. a good question. What happens when Christ isn't our sacrifice? These are still questions we can have open because this is the beginning of adventure to find out the truth about the altar. But isn't it possible maybe that we might be the sacrifice if Christ isn't our substitute? So how does this change our view of the following verse? For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And what does it mean then to be sacrificed on the altar? Why must there be a sacrifice? These are all questions we need to be asking, right? For sure. Where, where did God even come up with this? Why? Like, hey, Adam and Eve, you know, Cain and Abel, I want you to, you know, slaughter this animal and then I want you to put it on this altar because I'm just some pagan god and I like seeing animals cook on a flame. Wow. Like, I like barbecue. Like, right, right. <laughs> is that what's going on or is God going for something deeper here? He's going for something deeper. There is there's a letting go. There's there's a punish I don't want to say punishment again, but there is like consequences, right? And the consequences are just uh, to be covered by a sacrifice, right? Because to be transformed, yeah. you have to put away self to to ultimately come to a place of peace and repentance or forgiveness, you have to be able to let go, right? You have to let go of something else. Exactly. It looks like we opened up something new here. Where's this going? Where are we? 